Um, so I want to do a couple more number field things and then try and do some quadratic. No, five more minutes is the only option. Oh, <laughs> I'm just going to log out and log back in. Um, that's okay. So I want to do some, some more number field stuff and then talk about what? Okay, good. Username. I was all set up and ready to go. Um, and then I want to talk about binary quadratic forms in magma. Sorry, magma calculator. Great. So I want to start with a special elliptic curve that I found earlier, just four hours. Um, it's going to be the elliptic curve with Cremona label 26B2. Oops. Quotes actually, 26B2. This elliptic curve has a seven isogeny, so it has a Galois stable cyclic subgroup of order seven, which means it's got a point of order seven defined over a cyclic extension of Q. So I want to figure out what that cyclic extension is, and I want to, well, figure out what, exactly what that cyclic extension is, not just get a polynomial, but see if I can figure out what a nice representation of that extension would be. So here's my elliptic curve. Just to confirm to you that I'm not hiding, this isn't trivial. Let's compute the abelian group. Group. <laughs> what? Keith, what did you say? Submit. So this is trivial, has no rational points. So now I want to go through the process of adjoining a point of order seven, and, and I want to get a good point of order seven. So let's. Do division polynomial. And I want the seven division polynomial, and we should probably give it a name. Let's call it F7. And just for the sake of being able to read what it's actually, whoops, what it's actually doing, we'll give it so that it has it in seven with X's. Submit. So this is a fairly big degree 24 polynomial. And let's see if it factors. It should factor if this curve actually has a seven isogeny. Submit. And yes, it does. It factors into a degree three and then three degree seven polynomials. So let's call this factorization fact and we'll let F be fact. Oops. One, one, and just make sure we get our x cubed 15th. So there's our first polynomial. I want to look at the number field. Maybe I'll call it k, as I tend to do. F. So it's maybe worth remarking here, this number field, when I do the number field command, it's just adjoining one root of this polynomial. It's not the splitting field, it's Q adjoint alpha, where alpha is one root of the polynomial. Now, in this case, the Galois group of F is cyclic. F should be cyclic of degree three, so adjoining one root actually is adjoining all of the roots. But in general, if you want the splitting field, you might want to do the splitting field command, because you don't know a priori that adjoining one root will actually give you all of them. But I do because this is coming from a, a, an elliptic curve with a seven isogeny. I know the extension is going to be cyclic. So we'll base extend E now to K. So let's just delete all of this. E K I'll define to be elliptic uh, base change E up to K portion subgroup. And let's just see if we got our point of order seven. Nope, we didn't. So I need to add the y coordinates, right? I've just adjoined the x coordinates of my point of order seven, so I don't necessarily have the full... You're still asking for points that are angular. Oh, thank you. Spoiler alert. No, I'm still in a viewing group of order, order one. I, I knew what the right answer was, so I, I should have caught that, though. Um, but no, I actually do need to adjoin the y coordinate. So let's go ahead and do that. So before I do that, I need to remind myself uh, what is my polynomial or what is my equation for e that I'm using. Gosh, there we go. Submit. 
So let's kill that. We'll define our polynomial ring in Y. over k, and I'll let L be the extension of k, and now I'll just grab my equation of y, and all I'm going to do, or excuse me, my equation of e, copy and paste, and I'm going to just bring everything over to one side, so I'll make that equal sign a minus sign, and then I'm going to evaluate all my x's at a, because this is what I want a root of in my new field. And L, submit, there we go. Now I have a number field with this defining polynomial over K. And it's worth pointing out here, this is a relative number field at this point. If you ask what the degree of L is, it's going to tell me it's a degree two extension. Maybe I can get rid of that, right? Because it's thinking of this as an extension of K, not as an extension of Q. So if I wanted to think of this as a, an extension of Q, I would do absolute field. And now I have a degree six extension. Now I can ask maybe what the Galois group of this absolute field is. Galois group. And it's the permutation group acting on uh, a six-element set of order six, so it's cyclic of order six, and it's transitive. Um, you can get the defining polynomial and all of that, and that's oh, maybe I'll do that in a second. But let's first see E L will be the base change of E up to L. I think that should work. I may not. I may need E K. Let's just check. Oh, that's good. And now I can do torsion. Subgroup. Because it told me, well, okay, so hold on one second. Let me just enter this and I'll pull back up my Galois group. E up L. Thank you. So it did give me two generators. Is that what you're talking about, Alvaro? Oh, right, absolute field. So I think you'll notice that I have, so I have two generators here for my permutation group. But if I take the first cyclic one, well, it's a cyclic of order six. It's a group of order six. The, the excuse me, the, the first generator is order six, and it's in a group of order six. So it's got to generate all of it. But also, I think if you squint at this one, if you cube that first permutation, you get the second one. I mean, you have to. The other one has order two. And that's a generator order six. Right? So that's how I know it's cyclic. But if maybe Alvaro would be happier if I said, is cyclic? It's more fun if you code with intonation. <laughs> True. Up. Oh. Now, of course, I'm getting an error because I can't type down here. And huzzah, I have that I, I really do have a point of order 7 defined over this field. But the question is, what is this field? Well, it's the field of definition of the point of order 7. No, that's, I mean, <laughs> what is it? That's not what I'm asking. Is there, can you give me a good polynomial that generates this field? So let's ask what the defining polynomial of L is. I guess I want the absolute field of L. Submit. And there's our defining polynomial. It's not monic. It's pretty ugly. Right? So maybe we want to do a little bit better than this. And I'm going to use LMFDB to do better. I'm just going to pull off a couple pieces of information about this field from magma enter it into LMFDB and see if I can narrow down exactly what field this is. So let's scroll back up. And instead of looking at that, let's take, you know what, let's stop typing absolute field over and over and over again. And let's let F just be the absolute field. And maybe I'll have the generator be C, absolute field. 
let's let O be the maximal order of F, and let's compute the discriminant of F, and let's compute the discriminant of O. Just to see that these really are different. So there's the discriminant of the field, i.e. that polynomial that I'm using to generate it. And here's the discriminant of the maximal order, i.e. the thing that you actually think of as the discriminant. You can see, yeah, this probably is a bad polynomial, right? In some sense, the good polynomials have the same discriminant as the number field, if there is such a polynomial. But so now I have my discriminant. Maybe instead of pulling the discriminant of F, now let's pull the signature of F, submit. And so my signature is 0, 3. It's degree 6, totally imaginary. And my discriminant, now let's pull up LMFDB. LMFDB. Let's go to number fields, global number field. It's a degree 6, 6 field. The signature we said was what, 3, 0? Zero three, that's different. Zero three, so you're paying attention, that's why I did that. And the discriminant I don't remember, so we'll just come back here and copy and paste and search. And oh, look at that, there's a unique field with that discriminant and that signature, and here it is. And if you click on the label, it will pull up and start to tell you some information about this. And it turns out that this is just adjoining the seventh roots of unity. So that's all it is. This is, this, this is Q zeta 7. Um, you can see that because what we have here is a cyclic group, right? There, uh, excuse me, an abelian extension of Q has a conductor. The conductor is the minimum Q zeta n that contains that field, right? The Kronecker-Weber theorem says that every abelian extension is contained inside of of Q, thank you. I was going to say that, if not in a grammatically correct way, um, is contained inside of a cyclotomic extension of Q. And the conductor tells you exactly what cyclotomic extension that is. And so this should actually be this Q would join the seventh roots of unity. And let's see if magma can confirm that. We'll get rid of the signature question. And let's do is subfield. Let's see, I want to know if F is a subfield of this cyclotomic 7, submit, true. And so it comes with a Boolean, yes or no, whether it actually is a subfield. And if it is a subfield, it gives you a map from one field to the other one. Right, so in theory, I could come back here. I could keep track of my Boolean as well as my map. And then I could do the map applied to whatever my generator was, C, and see where it goes. And it goes to 1 7th, uh, it goes to that. I'm not going to read that to you. So you can really figure out exactly how these two fields are related. Maybe let's see one more example with less elliptic curve stuff going on. I um, guess I'll just, I'm going to just delete everything back to there. Well, let's just delete it all and start again. Why can't I? There we go. So this time I want to let little f be the polynomial whose coefficients are... I picked this carefully. Da, 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 da. All right, minus 5, 1, 21, minus 12, minus 1, and 1. Okay, A will be the number field. And maybe we'll ask, is Galois... See if adjoining one root actually is 
Oh, it's probably not is Galois. Well, let's just compute the Galois group then. Galois group. Submit. And now it really is only giving me one generator cyclic of order five. <laughs> and so this is a cyclic extension of degree five. Maybe it would be nice for you to see what the polynomial is. I just give you a string of stuff. Do it with x's. Submit. So it is a degree five polynomial, right? Six coefficients gives me a degree five polynomial. And so I guess the question now is what field is this? You can do the exact same thing as we did before. Let O be the maximal order of K, the discriminant of K now is P-I-S-C-R. And I want the discriminant of O anyways. O. Submit. There's our discriminant. So let's grab that and come back to our number field database. Now I have a degree 5 extension. Well, I don't know what the signature is. I do know what the discriminant is. And you know what? I know what the Galois group is. It's C5, cyclic of order 5. Search again. Here's our unique field. The discriminant here, if we would have factored, this is 31 to the fourth. And the conductor is exactly 31. So this should be a subfield of adjoining the 31st roots of unity. And let's see if magma can confirm that is subfield K field of 31. Submit, true, and there's our map. So we really can, at least for small fields, figure out exactly what cyclotomic field it contains. I'm assuming that there are abelian extensions using the, the LMFDB database. Sadly, there isn't a way to ask for the conductor of an abelian extension of Q in magma. It won't compute that. But LMFDB has it, so you can always just shoot on over there. And assuming you, you haven't gotten a, a really insane large field or, or something that's outside of the scope of what's been implemented so far for LMFDB, you can figure out exactly what field this is contained in. And so now I guess it's not as interesting because if I have a cyclic extension of Q of order 5, what are the subfields of this field K? Well, there's itself and Q, and that's it because it's a prime degree cyclic extension, C5 doesn't have any normal subgroups. But if I were smarter, I would have done this previously. You can also do just subfields of K, and that will return a list of all the subfields, the first one of which is the whole field itself. Oops, what did I just do? Well, that's okay, because I was done with that example anyways. <laughs> Uh, undo. Nope. I don't know what I just clicked either. Okay. But in any event, if you do subfields of a field, it'll return a list of all the subfields, or maybe you only want the quadratic subfields, in which case you could do subfields k comma 2. If you only wanted the degree 3, k comma 3, and so forth. So you can get all the subfields back, which is a nice way if you're just trying to figure out what the heck is in, going on in your field. You know, looking at what are the quadratic subfields, what square roots are in there that weren't there before. Um, I guess it would be nice to do a little group theory, just so you know it. Uh, Sim 5, this is the symmetric group of order 5, uh, excuse me, uh, the symmetric group acting on a set of order 5. Um, you can pull the subgroups of this. So subgroups of sim5 will return subgroups up to conjugation. So it won't give you, so it gives you conjugacy classes. And it gives you these in sort of a weird way in that it gives you not the group itself, but it gives you a, a record of the group that has a couple um, associated tags. So for example, if I find the fourth one of these and I hit submit, it will give me this this rec, right, which comes with a bunches of pieces of information, namely the order, the length, 
the subgroup and a presentation of that group as elements. And so if I wanted to work with the subgroup, I'd have to come up here and do uh, slash subgroup P. And now what I would have G is actually a subgroup, a group that I can work with. Let's pull this up. Let's do G. And now I have this group. So you can do things like let's search for all the subgroups of S5 with some properties. So let's take the, the subgroups G in here such that I want is transitive. So all the transitive subgroups of G. Now, if I just give it G like this, it's going to throw an error because what I'm, it's going to say you have the wrong type. And of course, I haven't defined G. So let's just do that so you can see what happens here. But I can't plug in a rec, one of these records. I have to plug in a subgroup into is transitive. And so I have to, again, convert this to a subgroup, hit submit. And now it'll give me all the records of the subgroups that are transitive. Again, I don't like this record format. So maybe instead of keeping the record, let's make this a subgroup. And now here are all the transitive subgroups of S5. You can do dihedral group, just capital D dihedral, capital G group, and N. Um, and then there's also the small group database. Have we seen, did I do something with small groups yesterday? No? So the small group database is really nice. At the end of the day, lots of questions reduced down to group theory. So let's look at all the groups of order eight. Everybody knows there's, well, let's not look at this anymore either. Everybody knows, of course, ah, small, small group eight is not what we want. We want small groups eight. There are five groups of order eight. Three of them are abelian. Two of them are non-abelian. Is that right? Let's double check. Let's maybe look at G, such that G in G, and let's just take is abelian. Mm. Oh, thank you. Typing. I can spell is. So there are three that are abelian. If I drop a knot in front of here, I get two that are not abelian. So what is it? It's D4 and Q8, right? The quaternions. Those are the two non-abelian groups. Those are not isomorphic. And the three abelian groups are, well, Z8, Z2 cross Z4, and Z2 cross Z2 cross Z2. Those are all my groups of order eight. Um, if you wanted to pick one of these off, you can do... Uh, small group eight comma one, and this will give me some information about. I uh, should get rid of this. So it's easier. Go back and forth. Group of order eight. It gives me my generators, and and tells me some relations. The first generator squared is the second generator. The second generator squared is the third generator, and so forth. It's not obvious exactly what this is, but if you search have groups of order eight. There's this website, Group Props, that has lots of information that you probably can't read. I can hear someone getting ready to yell at me. Right, so the GAF ID is the same as the small group ID. So these are all eight, and then one, two, three, four, or five. Eight, one is the cyclic group of order eight. Eight, two, eight, three, eight, four, and eight, five. Five. The last one is almost always the elementary abelian group of that order where it's just sort of stripped out as far as it can to have the most generators as possible. It seems strange to me, but I'm sure there's a good reason why. And then there's lots of information about each of these individual groups. Like if you're interested in the, okay, the dihedral group D8, this is D4, right? It's, it's not S2N. So they use this notation, but you can get presentations about it. You can get element-wise exactly what's going on, um, permutation representations, normal subgroups, general subgroups, subgroup lattices, basic properties, 
Uh, is it nil potent? What's the composition length? What do the composition series look like? All of that stuff. So the group props website, if you've reduced a question down to group theory, that doesn't mean you're done. But there is a lot of information out there about you know, various groups, particularly small groups. I think this goes up. I don't know how far up it actually goes. Certainly to 2050-something. Um, but but it, it's a, a certainly an awesome resource to have. Even if you just forget a lot of your group theory, right, the rank and, and all this is defined, you just have to click on it and go there. Um, any questions? Yeah. So small groups takes in the size that you want and returns the full list of all of those. Small group takes in an ordered pair, eight, comma, one, two, three, four, or five, which of the small groups of order eight do you want? So I think you can give it a small group, just eight. I'm not exactly sure what small group without an S and just a single number does. It maybe just picks a random group of order eight or it defaults to the first one, comma one. But so small groups will give you all the groups of that order. Small group with two numbers will give you one group of that order depending on which index you Other questions? I guess I haven't showed you. If you wanted to define an abelian group, group, you can do that by just giving it a list of numbers and say you want Z2 cross Z4, Z2 cross Z4, and maybe you want to throw a copy of Z in there. What number should you give it? Well, you don't want to give it infinity, so instead you'd give it zero. This should return Z2 cross Z4 cross Z. And those are our relations. And it's an abelian group. So abelian groups are real easy. And I guess you could also do, if you were so inclined, you can do direct products. Right? It's just capital D direct, capital P product. And then you can give it a vector of groups. It'll take the direct product of all of those. So you don't have to nest a bunch of direct products inside of it. So if you want to do the direct product of three groups, you don't have to type direct product three times or twice, I guess it would be. Other Questions, any other questions about group theory stuff that are things that you'd want to see about groups? No? The derived group, just derived group. It's all fairly intuitive. So maybe with the last few minutes of my time, and by few I mean 18, I will uh, do a little bit of binary quadratic forms since Alvaro has been talking about these. There's some stuff we can do with binary quadratic forms. So let's see what that is. Okay. So let's start by, let's let Q be the so binary quadratic forms plus a number will give you, I should make it return what it is, Q is all the binary quadratic forms of discriminant minus four. So whatever number you enter, that's the discriminant and it gives you the whole class of those. You can define a binary quadratic form by giving it an ordered triple, say 1, 0, oh, 1. And when I do that, it just gives me back a vector 1, 0, oh, 1. But it's now treating this object like a binary quadratic form. And this is the binary quadratic form where the first entry is the x squared term, the second entry is the xy term, and the third entry is the y squared term. So that's our quadratic form. We can, maybe we'll define another one. So let's call this form number one and form two. I'll have it be Q will be one comma two, two. Oh, sorry, F2, F1, submit. So if I gave it something that wasn't of discriminant minus four, it would it would be angry and throw an error at it. Um, but now you might start asking questions about uh, is are these reduced? So F one spoiler alert is reduced, but F two isn't. But I can ask is is reduced? F two submit false not reduced, just to, so you know I'm not lying to you, if you don't trust me already. 
F1 is true, it is reduced. And so I can ask, are these two equivalent? It's equivalent, F1 comma F2, whoops, little f. Submit. True, it is equivalent. They are. It doesn't look like anything happened because my outputs were the same. Maybe I'll do this so you can be convinced. I actually clicked that. It's true, they are equivalent. Now, hiding here, this doesn't just return a Boolean. It also returns the matrix that allows you to transform one into the other. So if I come back here, I'll call the Boolean boo. You can also do underscore if you just don't want to keep track of the Boolean at all whether it's true or false, and maybe I'll call the matrix M. Hit submit, and M, which is the matrix transformation from one of these to the next one, to go from F1 to F2, here's my matrix 1, 1, 0, 1. And you can even do, I hope, F1 times M equals F2. So if you want to apply a matrix change of variables from one quadratic form to another one, you just do the multiplication, the quadratic form times the matrix. Is, uh, can you do a M times F1 or is it always F1 times F1? You know, Alvaro, I'm not sure. I have a feeling it's going to be angry about this, but for you, I'll try. F1, yeah. You really always want F1 times M. It's just the convention. They've made their choices. And then you might wonder, well, what if I do F1 times M inverse? That's true as well, right? The change of variables is invertible. And there we go. It's equivalent. Da, 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 da. Oh, there's also a conjugate. F2, the conjugate just takes the xy term and changes the sign. Not sure why you'd want to do that, but you can do it, so that's nice. Um, let's do a slight, I mean, the, the boring thing about this set of quadratic forms is that we have class number one, so everything's equivalent to this one reduced quadratic form. And I guess I'm running out of time, so I'll jump to an even more interesting. Let's go to minus 71. So I think you've seen some examples. Minus 71. So I think I remember correctly, Alvaro put two of these up. We'll call F1 the quadratic form with coefficients 4, 3, 5. And F2 will be the quadratic form with coefficients 3, 1, 6. Six. And let's see, is F1, F2, false. So these aren't equivalent. So we really have class number bigger than one. You can ask for the class number minus 71. Ooh, class number seven. It's bigger than I would have anticipated. Well, okay, that's a lie. It's bigger than I would have anticipated yesterday before I did this computation. Um, but so a small discriminant for a very, fairly large class group. Um, I can take F1 and F2 and do Gauss composition by just doing F1 times F2. So the asterisk between them will compose them, and there's my new quadratic form. And maybe you want to know, is F1, F2... What did I just do? Equivalent to F2. False. Still not equivalent. Uh, you could square F1 by composing it with itself. Just F1 squared works. Now I get 316. Actually, 316, that is my F2. F2, submit, huzzah, neat. And so if this really has some group structure, there should be an identity. I can pull the identity of Q out. 1118 is the identity. And you can check that this actually is the identity 
by seeing if you do, well, okay, so this isn't maybe a perfect check, but it, it's a good confirmer. Does, if I multiply by the identity, do I get back the same thing? Submit. True. Those are the same. Wonderful. And so now you might want to know, well, what are all the representatives? Well, if this is really going to be an abelian group or a group at least, it should be cyclic of order seven. Right? And so let's just check. Well, first, if I raise this to the seventh, do I get back the identity? That's true. And excuse me, I just want to check F1's not the identity. That's true. So every one of these should be a power of F1. Every one of the, the equivalence classes up to change of variables, integer change of variables, should be represented by some power of F1. And so just to check and see what they are for N in uh, 0 dot dot 6. Let's do F1 to the N and N4. Submit. And those are all of our representatives. Well, they're not necessarily reduced. We could ask if they are reduced, and if not, we can put them into reduced form. I think reduced form. How do you put them in reduced form? That's what I was just looking at. I'm pretty sure it's just, well, let's see. Is reduced? It'd be interesting to see how many of these are already in reduced form. Oh, they all are. So I guess if you take a power of a reduced form, should you always get back a reduced form? I'll leave it to you to think about that. Um, but I'm pretty sure there is a way to do it. Oh, I think maybe it's representative reduction. reduction. Let's give it a try. We're all friends here. There you go. Reduction should work. I think so. So what's a good discriminant? Uh, yeah. 12 work for you? Uh, so then uh, let's see, an example should be zero com uh, 1, comma, 0, comma, minus 5, right? Oh, no, that doesn't work. I always forget how these things actually go. Number. Number one. So what's a good... Is there a generators? Of Q? Nope. 23? Do you have a form you want to work with? Not a valid discriminant. <laughs> Argument must be congruent. Oh, I'm sorry. I need a four times down here. So yes, you can, Alvaro, although I, I'm not sure how to pull up. Well, maybe Q.1. Let's see what that does. No. Sure, but uh, what do you want me to do with it? I'm not sure it can actually do that. Yeah, I, I wasn't able to find anything about that in Magma. Most of what I was able to find was how, given forms, you can make them interact with each other. With just a no S? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was right there. Last number 
of 40 is submit two. So that's a little, is this just giving me a representative? Is this a representative of the non sort of standard class? That's just a little strange to me. Any thoughts? Can you try squaring that one? See if it's good. Oh, if it's a generator, maybe? Yeah. All right, here we go. Oh, probably the identity would work. So let's do F and then let's return F and F squared. Submit. Can you guess I don't study quadratic forms? So I don't know. But it does do a lot of stuff. This is outside of my comfort zone, as if all of this wasn't. Um, but with the last five minutes, maybe we'll just call it. So maybe I'll take a couple minutes and thank the organizers for putting this together and all of you for bearing with me this week. It's been a real struggle. <laughs> <laughs> For me, and hopefully, you know, whatever. So thank you. <laughs>